Okay, imagine that you are approached by a group of political scientists, in this case model authors, who know nothing about writing Asia-based models, but they want to develop a model, they want to work with you to develop an Asia-based model about how people choose which candidate they will vote for. Um, so they basically make some very simple assumptions and they want to see if they can get it up and off the ground running, right, at first. They assume people have some initial candidate in mind, and so uh, they are willing to express those, those individuals express that feeling about who that candidate is. But as they talk to their neighbors, they may change their mind, and maybe, for instance, they, you know, they, they change their mind to agree with the majority of their neighbors in this particular case, right? So if that's the situation, you know, what would happen? What would happen in that, in that particular situation, right? Uh, so they want you to kind of develop that model. So what's the first thing that you should do? Well, the first thing you should do is start to formalize that kind of conceptual description of the model. And there are a number of ways you can do that. One of them is known as a flowchart, right? And so you might have seen this from um, some early software engineering diagrams or something like that. Um, and so you can write this out, right? So that you initialize agents to random votes. You're then gonna maybe color the agents based upon their vote. Um, agents then count the votes of their neighbors and change their vote to whatever the majority is. You can then ask if the system is stabilized. In other words, has anybody changed their vote since the last time an agent had a chance? If no, then go back and do the whole thing over again. Otherwise, count the final votes, right? So you can provide the political scientists with this document as one particular example of your understanding of the conceptual model, right? Another potential way that you could express your understanding of the conceptual model is known as pseudocode. So pseudocode is essentially you know, a version of code that's written in a way that's easy to understand. And in many ways, uh, NetLogo code often works as pseudocode, right? Because the NetLogo syntax is fairly easy to understand. Uh, at some points, even easier for people who don't know code to how to code than for people who do. Uh, but here's an example of using pseudocode for um, the voting model that we talked about. So you can imagine uh, that voters have color, which is either red or green. And then at, for each voter, you set their vote to be a random number of either random of either one or zero. And then you loop until the election, right? Where in each of those loops, you then have each voter uh, check to see if they're, you know, color themselves based upon what their vote is. Uh, and then change their vote uh, based upon uh, what, they, uh, what their neighbors are. So if the count of the neighbors' votes is greater than or equal to four, and my vote is zero, then I'm going to vote one. Else, if the count of the neighbors' votes is less than or equal to four, and my vote is one, then I'm going to vote zero, right? And then we could just display the count of the two votes as kind of one way to do it. So this is another way that you could express your model in maybe a little bit more detail to make it clear for the model authors to understand based upon what you are doing, right? Now, this also helps you, don't get me wrong, right? In many cases, um, for this particular course, the model developer and the model author is the same person, the, you, right? Um, and so writing down pseudocode, writing down flowcharts helps you to get, make sure that the model you're implementing is exactly the way you meant it to be. Now, a lot of times we think it is, but you know, it, it helps to have these intermediate steps to help verify that the model is doing what you expect it to do, okay?